try to stay with each breath. If it's too much to think about staying with the breath for the whole hour, stay with this breath, and then the next breath. In fact, if you start thinking too far ahead, you're going to miss this breath, and you're going to miss the point where the mind slips off. But if you keep things small, keep things manageable, you find you do a lot better job. So this breath, this breath, this breath. And as for your past breaths, well, for one thing, they're not here anymore. And whether you're able to stay with them or not, that doesn't matter. What matters right now is this breath. And again, breaths in the future are not here for you to look at. And you can't be responsible right now for whether you're going to stay with them then. You will be responsible then if you learn how to be responsible now. So take it one step at a time. And you find that even when the meditation is not the most pleasant thing, the taking it one step at a time makes it a lot more manageable. In other words, if the breath doesn't seem all that enthralling or all that absorbing, and there's a pain here or a pain there, it's a lot easier to take it one step at a time. Back when I was in Thailand, I had a fairly long alms round, and there'd be days when it was just pouring buckets, and there was no way I was not going to get wet, even if I had a big umbrella. The wind would blow, the rain would come down, and if I thought about the whole hour and a half that I was going to be out there slogging through the mud, it was difficult to get up the, the energy just to start on the alms round. But then I realized, of course, if I didn't go on my alms round, I wouldn't get to eat that day. So took it one step at a time, this step, this step, so this step. And you'd be surprised how quickly, when you take it one step at a time, an hour and a half, even if it's raining hard, how quickly that hour and a half goes, and how manageable it is. Because you're not weighing yourself down with a past or future, how many steps you've been, how many minutes you've been out on the road, and how much longer it's going to be before you get back to that place that's dry. You're right here, right here, right here. And you find that right here is okay. It's manageable. It may not be the most wonderful moment, but at least it's manageable. You find that this principle helps you through a lot. When you're dealing with pain, many times the pain gets really bad, not so much because the actual physical sensation is bad, but because you're weighing yourself down with thoughts about how long the pain has been going on and how much longer it's going to go on in the future. And so you're taking all that past and all that future, and you're weighing down this one little moment here in the present. No wonder it buckles under the weight, can't stand up to it. But if you have it support just this one moment, you find that it's capable. It can stand up to whatever weight there is in the moment. So the ability to focus exclusively on what's right, happening right here, right now. It's a very useful skill. One of the many skills we have to develop in meditating. After all, it's not the only skill. Some people want to make the whole meditation just that, being in the present moment. But that's only one of the skills we practice. There's a skill of how to make the present moment a pleasant place to be. And that requires some memory of the past, what's worked in the past, what hasn't worked in the past. That's called the skillful use of the past, just like there's a skillful use of the future, having a sense that this is going someplace. There is a direction to the practice. It's going to take you to total freedom. And that as you work on your skills, it's not always going to be stumbling along and falling down, having to pick yourself up, dust yourself up, off, 
walk a few more steps, stumble again. It's not always going to be that way. There comes a time when it gets a lot easier as you really do get into the breath and you begin to notice patterns. If you had no memory of the past, no sense of the future, you wouldn't be able to see patterns. In other words, what you've done, the results that come when you do it. That requires using the past skillfully, because some of your actions will have results in the immediate present, but some of them will take time to show their results. And if you don't have that sense of mindfulness, which is what you really need, which is what this memory of the past is, mindfulness. If you don't have that mindfulness, then you can't learn any lessons. And although each present moment may be a wonderful new beginner's moment, but still you don't learn anything from it. And your progress gets limited right there. So an important skill that we develop in the meditation is how to make skillful use of the past, skillful use of the future. And the Buddha outlined this in his teachings to the Galamas and also to his teaching to his son, Rahula. Notice your intention to what you do, watch what you're doing while you're doing it, and then watch for the results. See the connections between the type of intention and the type of results you get, either immediate or over time. That's the skillful use of the past. Unskillful use of the past is when you run back to either getting happy or sad about how things were in the past. Unskillful use of the future is when you start anticipating either with desire or with aversion or with fear what's going to happen in the future. The one fear that is useful is the fear of the consequences of unskillful actions. That's what keeps you on the path. And again, there can be the anticipation of how good it's going to be when you finally master this. But still, there's no way you're going to get there unless you follow the steps. So learn to recognize when, you're, when your mind is referring you to the past or the future, what are skillful ways of bringing in the past or the future, and what are unskillful ways. Sometimes a skillful recollection, say, of the future could be, you know, death can come at any time. Are you ready to go? If you're not, well, what are you doing right now to prepare yourself? That's using the future for encouragement. So when you see that the past, past and the future do have their uses, it's, that gives more dimension to the practice. If it were just a practice of staying in the present moment, we can all go out and have frontal lobotomies and that would be the end of it. But it doesn't work that way. You have to have some sense of the past. You have to be observant, remember things that worked and didn't work in the past, and then see how they apply in the present moment. Sometimes you have to relearn a lesson or adjust a past lesson, because what seemed to work in the past may not be working this time. It means you have to be even more observant of what's going on. But that doesn't mean you throw out the past totally. It means you take your knowledge and you adjust it. You make it more refined. And this is how the practice develops, how you build on your past mistakes and you learn how to build on your past successes as well. So remember that there's more dimension to the practice than just simply the present moment. But the skill of staying in the present moment is one of the more difficult ones to learn, so that's why we emphasize it so much. And again, where are you going to observe things if you're not really observant of the present moment? If the lessons you learned in the past aren't working, well, maybe you weren't really observant then. This is a chance to get more observant, more precise. Each breath, each breath. Learn which part of the breath cycle you tend to lose your focus. Some people find that it's in between the in-breath and the out-breath. 
in between the out-breath and the in-breath. Sometimes it's when a particular breath is uncomfortable, you, you don't like it, you move off. So learn to watch for any sense of tension or tightness that may appear in the breath. Watch out for the tendency to lose focus in between the breaths, seeing what you can do to counteract those tendencies if you find that those are the spots where you tend to move off. Ask yourself how you recognize the, the part where the out-breath turns into an in-breath. In some cases, it's very subtle. And we have a tendency when we're trying to create a boundary line like that to make it more real or more clearly drawn than it really is. So watch for that tendency as well, because that creates a lot of unnecessary tension. Try to be with the whole cycle of each breath. As precisely as you can. Then at the end of the meditation you can stop and reflect on what you did, what lessons you learned. Some of the lessons are immediately obvious. You do something, you, you get immediately good or bad results. Well, those lessons you don't have to reflect on the past. They're right there. Other lessons you learn by reflecting on, say, a, a bad session. Well, what did you do? Why isn't it going well? Why isn't it going well? When you have good sessions, reflect on those after you're done. What did you do? How did you focus the mind? Take that lesson, file it away for future reference. You may, when you pull it out from your metal filing cabinet and dis discover that it wasn't quite as precisely observed as you might, might want. So you have, but you have lots of breaths to watch, lots of opportunities to learn new lessons. And even though it may be incremental, it may be a gradual path, fortunately Theravada didn't have the Rush Limbaugh that the Chinese had. I think it was what the seventh patriarch who de denounced every gradual path as being an obstacle to awakening. And was just really vicious in attacking any other viewpoint. Fortunately, Theravada doesn't have that problem. In fact, its problem goes the other way. There's a passage in the Odana where the Buddha compares the practice to the continental shelf off of India. He said there's a gradual slope and then a sudden drop. And the commentaries reinterpreted that to make it mean totally gradual without any sudden drop. But the Pali obviously says there is a sudden drop. So the gradual slope does take you there. Without the gradual slope, you wouldn't get to the sudden drop. Without the sudden drop, the gradual slope wouldn't have any real meaning in terms of opening up to something really new. But the way causality works, there is the opportunity for making gradual, very precise observations about your breath, getting more and more skillful as you learn over time. And then you finally hit the point where it all breaks open, opens up in unexpected ways. So the path is both gradual and sudden. And as you're working on each breath, each breath, each breath, Remember that you're on a path that takes a long time, but every journey requires individual steps. This is why the Buddha called it a path. If it weren't a path, it wouldn't have any direction. But it does have a direction. And the gradual steps, ultimately, as you get more and more precisely in the present moment, with more skill, the skill that you've learned from the past. You finally get so you can open up to something totally other. And it's all right here. You don't have to look anywhere else. This is one of the amazing things about the Buddhist teachings. 
all the great lessons we have to learn are right here. We don't have to think about some past way back at the beginning of the universe. That's not relevant. The relevant things are what we can see for ourselves right here, right now. Things change. Well, how do they change? Is there a pattern to their change? Watch right here and you'll find out. And it's a watching that grows more precise over time. Because you learn how to make skillful use not only of the past, but also your memories, and not only of the present, but also your memories of the past, your anticipation of the future. Learn to use them properly, and they all become part of the path.